Scotland, where fair white thistledown floats like an idle thought, where the purple bonnet of the thistle and the bonny heather bell paint the rolling countryside. A land that has bred into her people much of its sturdiness and beauty. A land over whose moors and slopes great pages of history and courage have been written. Hallowed ground, these peaceful vistas. Ground over which clansmen followed the gallant Wallace and Bruce. Land of a perfumed quietude and sweet content. Scotia, of which one of her poets wrote. Land of brown heath and shaggy wood. Land of the mountain and the flood. What mortal hand can e'er untie the filial band that knits me to thy rugged strand. The famous black-faced breed of sheep freely graze in highland glens. And their long cream-colored bull decorates the grasping bushes. No lakes in the world are better known, more widely sung than Scotland's Loch Lomond, Loch Katrine, and countless others. No lakes anywhere are more fair. Many with bordering fringes of mountain peaks are bend. At every Caledonian turn, beauty spots have always called to artists who paint with brush our words. One such artist was the beloved Robert Burns, born here near the town of Ayr 180 years ago. One whose songs and verse have lived close to two centuries and will continue to live for a. Bobby Burns sang not only of his land, his was the courage in a day of strict restraint to sing of joy, of the joy that he knew lay in the hearts of his fellow Scots, of the joy and sentiment that mingle in his auld lang syne, which first rose to the rafters in Tam O'Shanter Inn, the poet's favorite retreat. Another Scottish minstrel wrote here at Abbotsford, Sir Walter Scott. His lovely ladies and chivalrous knights were born in fancy in such surroundings. Earliest of the Romanticists, Scott lives forever. His library is as he left it. His imagination brought to life fictional people who still live along with him. At this very desk, he gave immortality to Scotland. And it was in Dryborough Abbey near Abbotsford that Sir Walter Scott reached his final resting place. Now a pile of crumbling stone, seven centuries old, showing the marks of wars and time. Yet, ruined splendors of a yesteryear still return to clothe bare walls in a glorious aura of reborn grandeur. Not far away lies the historic city of Edinburgh, capital of Scotland, and with the help of Leith, one of the British Empire's most important ports. Nestling on the hills that border the Firth of Forth, this beautiful metropolis abounds in world-famed educational institutions. And Scott, born there, stands in stone on beautiful Prince's Street. Outstanding landmark, high on its hill overlooking the city and giving it a likeness to Athens, is faithful Edinburgh Castle. A castle door that made history 400 years ago when it swung to admit the tragic Mary, Queen of Scots. Beautiful, young, although a widow, Mary returned to her castle in rain to discover her world all changed. On a wild December night in this palace at Linlithgow, Mary the Princess was born. The storm which raged outside this room, where first she breathed the breath of life, followed her through all her troubled years, from Rizzio to Darnley. Followed her later to Holyrood Abbey, where she yielded to fascination and was married to the conspiring Bothwell, an event that contributed greatly to the end of her hectic six years in power. Walls whose stones are steeped in living drama, whose voice would outflame the wildest romance of today. Between Holyrood and Edinburgh stretches an historic mile, known as the Royal Mile, 
royal because over its cobbles and between its buildings strolled Scottish kings and queens and all their courtly retinue. Along this regal route still stands the medieval house where John Knox lived, whence he watched to the favored passers-by, whence he worked to change Scotland into a Protestant country. Scots of old are Scots of our day, all lay claim to our interest and respect. Here is Dunfermline, the home city of a later Scotsman, Andrew Carnegie, who left his land for the seeking of a fortune in America. Here the man whose philanthropies bless a world was born. Jutting picturesquely into the North Sea lies the old gray town of St. Andrews revered in clubhouses the world over as the ancestral home of golf. Here is the granddaddy of all golf houses, christened the Royal and Ancient at its founding in 1754. Here a king and a tradesman teamed up against two noblemen for the world's first championship match. While the banner of the Royal and Ancient game flew proudly in the northern breeze. In the earliest days, balls were made of leather and stuffed with feathers. Balls were colored then because the course originally was covered with white daisies. St. Andrews perpetuates the memories of its champions in what probably is one of the strangest of cemeteries. The inscription on one reads, in memory of Tommy Morris, age 24. Three times in succession he won the champion's belt. Indeed, a record to inspire his followers of today. Other stones, too, perpetuate the memory of lesser champions who lie in the shadow of the venerable stone clubhouse. St. Andrews, symbol of a sport which has become an international ambassador for goodwill among all nations. To the skirl of hundreds of bagpipes, the Highlanders gather at Braemar. Rousing tunes call the clans from the hills, not for battle as of old, but for festivity, games, and contests. Here, one finds a happy people, closely knit by family ties, proud of their rich historic heritage, proud of their significant tartans, expressing their loyalty to their respective clans. Family groupings whose beginnings are lost in the highland fastnesses whence so many of them sprang. The tartans swing, the music mounts from the lips of youth and veteran, brother Scots from Maidenkirk to Johnny Groats, Scots the world around, brave, honored, and gay. Yeah. 